All right. Um, hello and welcome to our 2022 Data Engineering Salary Report. Uh, this is our second annual report and we're excited to go through salary data, market trends, industry diversification, and hiring research. So I'm confident that most, if not all of you know Birchworks, but just as a reminder, we are the leader in talent solutions in all things data, analytics, data science, data engineering, market research, and all the technolo technologies that support them. I'm happy to share that this year, we have once again been recognized by Forbes as one of the best recurring firms. And just a few publications of where we've been featured over the years um, based on our research, the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, and the New York Times. We're doing something a little bit fun this year. Um, make sure to stay until the end. We are picking three lucky attendees who will have the chance to win a $100 Amazon gift card. So today, myself and David will be presenting our report. Uh, my name is Natalie and I came to Birchworks from the technical recruiting sector. I currently lead our data engineering and BI division and support our contract, contract to hire, and direct hire talent solutions. And I'd also like to introduce my colleague, David. Thanks for having me, Natalie. Hey, everyone. I'm David. I come from a background as a data analyst, and I'm now a technical recruiter for Birchworks Data Engineering Direct Placement Team with a specialized focus in data architect roles. Cool. Thanks, David. Uh, Thank we're you. excited to present this year's findings. Um, we do have a chat box. Um, if you guys have any questions, please submit them there, and we'll do a question and answer section at the end. So like I said, we're super excited to present this year's data. First, we're going to be discussing the rise of the data engineer and the need for this report. Uh, then we'll be discussing how the different demographics compare, then into salaries and trends from the last year. In the second half of the presentation, we will talk about hiring trends we've seen this year, and there is a fair amount to unpack there. Um, we all know about the great resignation, and our research provides a fair amount of insights around how it has impacted engineering teams, businesses, and salaries. Um, I also wanted to share some actions that our senior contacts and clients are taking to stem attrition. Um, and then we'll get to those questions, so don't be shy. Make sure to get them in. So as I mentioned, this is our second annual salary report for data engineering. Most of you are probably familiar with our data science and AI report that was released earlier this year for its 10th publication. Um, for all reports, our data is collected privately through personal one-on-one -on -one interviews. I know there are you know, laws in many states that do not allow employers to ask about current compensation. Um, our experience has been that most people, because they know us, trust us, have a relationship with us, freely share their information. Also, because we're so seasoned in data engineering recruiting, um, we know when someone might not be giving us the right numbers. Uh, we probably already have information on the colleagues sitting right next to them to compare it to. So a little bit about the sample for this year's report. Um, we collected information from almost 600 engineering professionals. That's across the nation at all levels of experience and spanning all industries. We'll touch on the highlights this morning, but there's plenty more to dig into. So be sure to download your own free copy at birchworks.com study. So let's talk about the rise of the data engineer and why we started this report. So data engineering is our newest division and growing fast at Birchworks. As companies saw data volumes increase, there was a need to split responsibilities. Data engineers were tasked to take on more of the building of data infrastructure to manage mass amounts of data that was coming in. Since our inaugural report last year, we saw many of our predictions come to fruition, including a constant high demand for data engineers, investment in growing teams, and an influx of early career engineers. 
I'd also like to piggyback off that real quick with data engineering uh, uh, evolving. We've seen a lot of data engineers wanting to transition to more modern tech stacks such as Databricks and Snowflake. However, most recently we have seen a spike in interest for Prefect as an orchestration tool and DBT. So now I'm going to get a little bit into the shift in hiring trends and what we've been seeing with candidates. So last month we sent out a survey to close to 400 engineers to get first-hand feedback on the shift in hiring. So with the current economic climate, it's not a shock to any of us to see that job security was almost equivalent to compensation. I've spoken to dozens of candidates in the past few months who have been a part of a company that ended up laying off a lot of people. And even though that candidate specifically wasn't affected by the layoff, they had a lot of concerns in the long term of just staying there worried that their uh, role is not as secure as it once was. So they are starting to go on the market and look for another opportunity where they would feel more secure in the long term. However, after job security, we still do see a large chunk of people that do prefer, prefer fully remote roles, and that is due to personal reasons. And getting into the market overview, just given the immense volume of professionals changing jobs, along with the buzz surrounding the great resignation, we also sent out another survey earlier this year to ask data professionals about their sentiments when considering new opportunities. If you look at the pie chart, the very first one, um, you can see that 58% of individuals were still looking for a new opportunity. However, industry is playing a huge, huge role of importance as we go into market uncertainty. So people are thinking about which industries will power through the recessions and they are going there to seek shelter for safety. But if you look at the lower right pie chart, as in terms of benefits, it's no surprise that people are still looking for a work-life balance. So they are prioritizing, about 56% of people are prioritizing PTO over 401k and insurance. And within the past couple of years, there's been a huge change when it comes to hiring. The great resignation has allowed for companies to view hiring in a different ways. Uh, so we have seen companies promote evergreen job openings, meaning that this is a nonstop way to get an influx of resumes for roles that they are consistently hiring for. Uh, in the past, we have worked with a couple of candidates who are on this Evergreen, uh, who have job openings for that's called Evergreen. And they, even though their pipeline is pretty much full of candidates that they are currently interviewing, they still encourage us to see candidates and send over resumes just for that Evergreen job openings because they're always going to have a constant need for that specific role. And due to that, we have also seen companies reevaluate their hiring process. This has included removing technical assessments. So a lot of the candidates I've spoken to, they have been very transparent and they told me upfront that they don't want to do a technical assessment as part of the interview process. On top of that, they are also pretty transparent and say that they don't want to do more than two rounds of interviews. So companies have heard the have heard of this. They're seeking out, um, you know, what the clients or the candidates are looking for, and that caused them to change their multi-day interviews to a one panel round of interviews where they would have multiple leaders from an organization sitting in for that one 45 to 60 minute interview. So this has cut down the time to about a week to two weeks maximum. And companies who have done this, they have a greater chance of getting accepted offers and keeping candidates engaged and interested in the hiring process. So on top of that, uh, we'd also like to say that relationships matter. You know, with the candidate market being so hectic, individuals have turned to internal networks or referrals. So we always do encourage people to leave, to not leave on a bad note because you never know where your next opportunity is going to come from. Sure. And something that I, I recently just heard was someone using the term boomerang employee. Um, so this describes an employee who left a company and came back after a short period of time, um, which just shows that sometimes the grass isn't always greener and it's important to maintain relationships um, and leave on a good note. Absolutely. And so as we all know, the idea of remote work has opened doors for individuals to work in cities across the country. However, on the other side, for what the clients are looking for, there's been a shift. So clients are shifting more quickly to a two to three day hybrid model where they are expected to come into the office on a partial or as needed basis. And with that being said, even though there are countless roles and opportunities open to those that are seeking a fully remote position, not a majority of the roles are not available as often assumed or reported by the media. 
So from conversations that we have had with clients, it's evident that they are looking for candidates that are open to going into office at least twice a week, and there has been a greater push across the industries to return to office in some capacity. However, if you can look at the charts right here, there is a discrepancy between the candidates and the clients. What the candidates want is not what the clients are seeking. So candidates, you know, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, they are still looking for fully remote opportunities due to some personal reasons. Could be something that's happening at home that they found is more convenient for them to just stick it out and work remotely. Whereas there are other people who are also transparent and say that they don't want to sit in traffic anymore for a total of two hours of their day, which was the norm about three years ago. But we do still come across other candidates in the market who do like that hybrid model. They like that human interaction and they like going into the office and collaborating. Uh, and just to put it into perspective for you guys, uh, for what the clients are seeking, based on the roles that we are currently working on on the data engineering side, I can say right now that we have about 20 roles and of those 20, only 17 are hybrid and the rest are remote. So that is only about three out of 20 roles that are remote. But we will definitely continue to monitor these trends and report back into the future. And now onto the data. Perfect. So first, let's look at some demographic information about each of our groups. So education and highest degree earned for data engineers. A majority of our sample held a master's degree as their highest degree at 55% at 55%, 58% of all professionals in the sample held an advanced degree. Professionals with a bachelor's degree as their highest education are still common in data engineering. And as we mentioned, there's a huge influx of students entering the data and analytics space. So I would predict that this number increases over the years. We've seen many candidates starting a job while working towards their master's degree in tandem. And although the master's degree does take the cake here, we usually do not see that preference from, uh, for a master's degree from our clients, but we do see a heavy emphasis for a bachelor's degree in that specific field. And just going on about that, just speaking of bachelor degrees, similar to data teams belonging to various business functions across organizations, academic programs are also not one size fits all. 20 years ago, there was only a handful of programs that people could utilize at university across the country to kickstart their careers in data. Nowadays, you see it everywhere. In our sample that we had, bachelor degrees have increased by about 4% in 2022, and we do see that number to continue to increase. So the influx of graduates entering the industry coupled with students pursuing higher education has resulted in a vast variety of programs across the country. Sure, and most data engineers, their area of study, um, they come from degree backgrounds with a technology focus such as computer science and business, which was over 50% of our sample. Compared to data science professionals, data engineers are more likely to have a computer science degree, but engineering degrees are also becoming increasingly common. Analytics, natural sciences, and social science degrees comprised less than 5% of our sample. Those degree tracks are more common for data science. I'd also like to add that what's also allowing people from different careers to transition to the data space are boot camps. I mean, boot camps have become more relevant nowadays and can be found at most universities. So there are people who have started off their careers in a different background, for example, science. I mean, the example I can give right now, is, which is perfect, I recently placed a candidate with one of our clients who came from a physics background. He graduated with a physics bachelor's degree, stayed in that field for about 20 years working there. Then he did about a 24 week boot camp over a year and a half ago. And now he just kickstarted his career in data engineering. So, with data engineering being hot in the market and providing longevity, it is turning heads, causing people to consider switching their careers. Mm -hmm. And data engineers in our sample, as far as industry, were most commonly found in financial services, consulting, and technology sectors. Um, from conversations we've been having with candidates, we've noticed that there's an increased interest in healthcare and pharma due to increased stability that startups might not always offer. Advertising and marketing services remain as our smallest industry segment. So let's talk a little bit about the gender breakdown. Men continue to outnumber women in this field. However, in more positive news, we did see almost a 1% increase from last year. 
female candidates are in high demand to help diversify companies' data teams. Um, just last year, in my experience, I had um, a woman candidate who, by the time we were able to get her an offer, she had eight other offers. Um, so companies are definitely putting a priority on diversifying their team, which sometimes could lead to multiple offer situations. So how is the gender distributed? So similar to data science and analytics, women are more common among individual contributors. So if you look at our individual contributor uh, category, 16% of our DE1 category and 17% of our DE2 category are women. But that significantly drops to five and 6% respectively for MG1s and MG2s. So how do we battle this, right? There are organizations to help increase women's presence in the data field, such as Women in Data Science, which is out of Stanford, Women in Analytics, and then Women in Data. They provide education, community, and support to women who are interested or who are in the data field. We'll be partnering with a few of these organizations over the next couple of months, so stay tuned for upcoming events. All right, what everyone's here to he what's everyone here to see is the salary for data professionals. So first, David is going to explain how we categorize our sample. Thanks, Natalie. So I'm going to get into how we divided our data engineers into two categories. As we just heard Natalie say, she was briefly ex uh, explaining DE1s, DE2s, MG1s, MG2s. I'm gonna kind of clarify that to everyone just so we they can get a better understanding. So uh, we divided into two different categories, the individual contributors or what we like to call ICs and then the managers. So then after that, we further segment each of these into three levels and we base that on things like the number of years of experience, the type of work performed, for the individual contributors, whereas for the managers, we look at the number of direct reports that they have and the type of leadership exercised for the managers. So if you look at the chart, like for example, level two for a data engineer IC, we look at the number of years of experience, which is 48 years for this one, but we also look to see if they are more advanced and more hands-on. But if we switch over to the managers for level two, we look for the number of direct reports. In this instance, it would be four to 15 direct reports. And we also look for some sort of a director title in the role. And of course, the compensation has been changing over time. So with data engineers being high in demand, many companies continue to invest in digital transformation efforts to not only thrive, but survive in today's data-driven economy. So this has led to many professionals taking advantage of the active market and this has allowed them to obtain multiple offers. So companies that wish to hire and retain top talent, they need to make sure their offer package is very competitive because every category that we saw here, there was an increase compared to last year. Uh, just for an example, for the data engineer level two, for the individual contributor, they average about 137,000 for their base salaries. Whereas for the data engineer managers level two, they average around 211,000 for their base salary. Mm -hmm. What a year. And also, if you look at DE3 and DEMG1, they are similar. We saw this in a couple of our other studies as well. It's mostly because DE3s are acting as leads, so their compensation reflects that, while DEMG1s are acting as first-time managers with reports. So for some companies, these can be interchangeable. So we can't do a direct care comparison to last year's report because we updated our categories for this year. Um, with a larger sample size, it made sense for us to provide more specified data for smaller groups. This will remain consistent with our other studies and also give us an opportunity to report better salary findings for years to come. So we divided the data engineer salary into five different regions across the nation. And if you look at the chart, this one is specified for data engineer level three because this one did have the most robust sample size. But what's interesting if we take a look at this map is that we typically see the West Coast and the Northeast to be higher than other regions. However, this chart is showing that the mountain region is higher than the Northeast. And this could be because we see a lot of IT companies moving to Colorado and Texas. But if you do look at the bigger picture, all the salaries are only about 14K of each other within all five regions. So it's not a monumental difference, but the West Coast does definitely remain to dominate in all of our categories. 
Mm -hmm. Which brings up a good point. So if a West Coast company would be open to remote, they could source for regions that are lower cost of living and help save budget. Now, this might get a little complicated with people moving to lesser COLA areas, sometimes at the same salaries and sometimes not. So you may be asking, what does the future have in store for data engineers? Well, I spoke to an expert who has remarkable clairvoyant powers. <laughs> One of our favorite sayings, which everyone has no doubt heard, and it's very appropriate right now, is the only constant in life is change. So things out there in the business world are changing pretty rapidly currently. Uh, the rapid fire hiring for data engineers may hit a speed bump soon, but on the other hand, may remain constant. Here's a short list of notable recent layoffs. Uh, you could probably easily have predicted some like Peloton, Zillow, Coinbase, but many are more of a surprise. Netflix, Meta, and even Amazon said that they overhired last year. So these layoffs are, are increasing our talent pool after many candidates have already accepted new offers. In Q2, we sent out a survey to about 130 of our clients asking their intention of hiring plans for Q3 and Q4. 81% of our clients had said that they were continuing to hiring through Q3 and Q4. 14% are holding steady and 5% are cutting back. We sent out the same survey in January and we only saw a 2% dip in hiring plans. So it doesn't seem to be as bad as the media is projecting. From my conversations, this could be due to clients needing to use budget before the end of this year as they aren't sure what their budget or what's to come in 2023. But as we know, it is a time of change, so make sure you follow us as we continue to monitor developments in the market. There is going to be a lot in the upcoming quarter. So overall, things are good. The future for data engineers is very strong. And congratulations to all of you for picking the right field of study to support in a long and prosperous career. Companies are racing to stay competitive and are all now very aware of the critical need to leverage data to stay ahead of the pack. New technology is going to continue to bring more and more opportunities to the data engineering community. You have the ability to have a meaningful impact, not just to drive profit to bottom lines of organizations, but to improve lives through smarter use of data. And those opportunities are all around you and are waiting for you. So thanks for joining us today. So for more salary and hiring market information, you can download our full report at birchworks.com study. We have 30 pages of compensation from the last year and qualitative insights. We also have our data science and AI study that was released earlier this year. And we do have an upcoming market research salary report, which will go live at the end of this month. If you have joined us today and you're hiring in data engineering or BI, we do um, provide contingency retained and contract services from entry level all the way up to CAO. So you can contact us at info at birchworks.com. Um, you know, in addition to our, our direct placement services, we have seen an uptick in demand for contract resources in this area as well. Um, so please reach out if you're interested in hearing more. I also wanted to mention that we release content every week on LinkedIn and on our website, which provide career tips um, for candidates and also for clients on how to adjust their hiring process. And finally, feel free to stay up to date with us on LinkedIn and all social media platforms. Um, this uh, report will also be live on our YouTube channel. Great, so let's get to questions. Um, if you have any additional questions, please submit them through the chat. Um, we would love to, to help answer. Um, we did have some um, participants who submitted questions ahead of time. Um, so we'll do those first. Um, our first question submitted was, I'm interested if you can include time at current company as internal promotions are typically less than new jobs. Um, 
So this is a very interesting question and not something we have data behind right now. What I can anecdotally share is that why we don't recommend this, um, we do have candidates who get counter offers while putting in their notice, um, but unfortunately most raises and promotions are often received when switching new jobs. Great, and it looks like the next question, are salaries expectations for data architects softening and are data engineers and architects still hard to come by? Great question. So from our data, actually, uh, data architect salaries have remained steady. Data architects are considered a high level IC. So it does depend on how technical versus how strategic the role is. And there's still a great number of openings for both the engineers and the architects, but it's common for these candidates to be off the job market within about two weeks with possible multiple offers. Mm -hmm. Which kind of leads us into the next one. So what's the approximate timeline number of interviews from application to offer and what titles are requested often in this area? So as advocates for clients and candidates, we recommend a two week timeline from application to offer. This way the candidate remains interested in the company and the role and the company also mitigates the risk of interviews for another company, which could lead to a multiple offer situation. As for number of interviews, depending on the role for individual contributors, we recommend a two to three step interview process. For managers and above, we understand that there may need to be three to four to determine viability. Most common titles in the area that we recruit for are data engineers, data architects, BI engineers, and most recently we've seen an uptick for data governance and data quality type roles. So next question, um, so how often do companies want extensive SQL skills? So within data engineering, SQL is actually considered a basic skill set to have. So most of the clients that we have worked with, they will have some sort of SQL questions during the interview process, just to ensure that you are able to write queries and navigate the database on your own. Perfect. Um, and then long-term outlook on remote working trends. This is, Definitely a hot topic. So as we mentioned earlier, our data shows a large disconnect between clients wanting hybrid workers and candidates wanting full-time remote positions. As of right now, the sweet spot seems to be two days in office um, from our candidates. Companies who are looking for three plus days in office are greatly reducing their candidate pool. Uh, companies who are open to remote will have a larger pool of candidates and be able to pull from states with lower cost of living. But from what we've seen um, anecdotally, there is no formalized policy for a lot of our clients yet. Um, it seems like they're all trying to navigate that. Right. Great. So someone also asked about data governance and its requirements in the industry. So this is a, it's a very timely question. Uh, we've been recently working with several clients on governance roles, specifically heads of. So companies right now, they are looking for candidates to take on the full scope of governance and help build out that framework from the ground up. And once that individual is in place, we've seen needs for people to build out that organization, including stewards and quality professionals and so forth. So companies are bringing in mass amounts of data and they are now looking for governance professionals to help bring meaning to that data and streamline it across the organization to accelerate their digital transformation. However, in terms of data governance, data stewards, strategists type of roles, we are seeing require, requirements for um, metadata management, agile data management, as well as enterprise data management, in addition to data validation and source target mapping. We've also seen an interest in candidates who have experience with Alterx or Calibra. Mm -hmm. Um, the next question we got was, what aspects of data engineering are fading and which ones are important? Um, so as we continue to move into the cloud, um, we've seen less and less uh, need for DBAs or typical warehousing experience. Top skill sets we see of importance are experience with a company's um, cloud preference, AWS, GCP, or Azure. Um, next question that was submitted through the chat is what is a candidate's willingness to take a contract to hire a role and what are the benefits of this type of position? Um, a candidate's willingness to take a contract hire role, um, I think there can be a couple different things. Um, they could have been, you know, impacted by a layoff um, and they're looking for their next role. They might be a little skittish to jump into their next role given what they just came from. 
Um, I think as we work through um, this these new data engineers who are entering the field, um, contract to hire roles are a really great way to broaden your experience, work with different tools, um, and and gain experience if you're um, if you don't have as much in your on your resume. And then what are the benefits of this type of position? Um, the benefits can be great. So typically in contracting, um, right, there is an at-will contract. If you've been um, part of the population who was working during COVID and felt like you um, were working over 40 hours a week um, and maybe not getting you know, the, the compensation, um, contracting is typically hours worked, hours paid. Um, so it gives you a little bit more uh, work-life balance. Um, I think I also kind of mentioned this earlier, but the benefits definitely come around expanding your um, experience level as well with certain tools, certain skill sets, um, and also within industries. If you're looking for that long-term home, um, you might be interested in trying out a different, a couple of different places first before landing. And now what a lot of people I'm sure we're also excited for as part of this presentation are the raffle winners. So we do have three raffle winners that we'll be randomly selecting. Uh, so drum roll please for the first winner. And I apologize if I butcher anyone's name in advance. <laughs> so our first winner is gonna be Ying Zan. Congratulations Ying. Congratulations. And, yeah. And then for our second winner, we have Andrew Nguyen. Great, congrats, Andrew. And our third is going to be Ahmed Arui. And those are our three winners. So congratulations, everyone. Our director, Hassan, will be sending out your gift cards to the email you registered with. So we all appreciate your participation. Once again, we'd like to thank you all for joining us, and we definitely look forward to next year's report. Thank you.